Hello folks and welcome to another episode of Retracing History. Now normally when we do these videos we're talking about human history, in particular relatively recent human history. We talk about military history, we talk about industrial history, normally occurred in the past 200 years. We don't often talk about natural history on this channel. And well, it's no secret that we're located in the Laurel Highlands of Pennsylvania. We're in southwestern Pennsylvania where most of my videos are set. And in the Laurel Highlands we have the largest cave system in the state of Pennsylvania. So I think it'll be cool if we retrace some geological history and we go underground and learn the history of Laurel Caverns. Now most history videos start at the beginning of our story. Okay, get ready because we're going further than we have ever before on our channel. We're talking millions of years here, folks, when Laurel Highlands and much of the world was an ocean. Okay, maybe that was too far. Let's go to the point that the tectonic plates finally shoved up the Appalachian Mountains. Pennsylvania's segment of that range is dubbed the Alleghenies, and the westernmost ridge of the Alleghenies is Chestnut Ridge. And if we were to cut it in half, you'd see all sorts of layers of rock and utter sediment. Over the millions of years, the carbonic acid of rainwater would gradually seep through the ground, gravity pulling it deep under Chestnut Ridge. But things get interesting when it came in contact with a section of Loyal Hanna limestone. Because of years of stress, hairline fractures came to be found throughout the segment of limestone, which are dubbed joints. When the carbonic acid seeps into these joints, a breakdown ensues that carries away bits of the calcium in the limestone. Now if we were to speed through millions of years, you'll see the joints expand into catacombs full of sand. Additional groundwater would carry away some of the sand over a couple more million years, and ta-da, you've got yourself a cave. It will not be until the past few hundred years that the cave system starts popping up in recorded history. In the early 19th century, a John Delaney acquired different plots of land to create a 114-acre farm on top of Chestnut Ridge. This farm would include a face of limestone that once was quarried in the days of the American Revolution. Amongst the limestone was a curious opening which had attracted at least two curiosity seekers. In 1802, two young men from nearby Smithfield went missing on Chestnut Ridge. They were found barely alive after becoming lost for three days inside Delaney Cave. In 1804, a myth developed that the highway robbers known as the Kirk Gang had stashed silver bars in the cave. Then in 1816, a journalist from Philadelphia named John Paxton spearheaded what is now considered the first geological survey of the cave system. Paxton was amazed to find certain walls covered with graffiti. People had been exploring and using the cave far longer than anticipated. After Paxton's visit, the cave was frequented by locals who blazed a trail from the town of Fairchance to the mouth of the cave. The property changed hands multiple times throughout the 19th century. It wouldn't be until the onset of the Great Depression that the cave began to resemble its current existence. Roy Kale, who had visited the cave often in his youth, jumped at the chance to own the property. His brother, Norman, was dumbfounded by Roy, who would buy a large tract of land five miles from the nearest road, especially at a time when the economy was suffering. But once Norman entered the cave for the first time, he arguably became more of a cave enthusiast than his brother. The Kale brothers quickly met a regular visitor of the cave, a graduate of civil engineering from Penn State by the name of Ralph Bazart, known better as Buzz. When the Depression came, Buzz was allowed to live on the Kale property in the summer of 1933 in order to survey the cave, and he surprised the brothers. Their present property boundaries only covered a small portion of the cave system. While they wouldn't know it at the time, Delaney Cave lay host to over four miles of passages that descended over 450 feet underneath Chestnut Ridge. Buzz also began to keep tabs of annual visitation to the cave, noting over a thousand visitors in 1933. Many of these visitors were no longer locals, but travelers along US 40, the National Road, and were staying at the nearby Summit Inn. Sprawling hotel near a massive cave, starting to sound very similar to Mammoth Cave in Kentucky, don't it? But you'll be surprised to learn that while Roy and Norman talked of commercializing the cave, those plans never got underway until 1962. By this point, Norman was the primary owner of the site. 
Excavation work was undertaken to remove the sand to clear up the passages, and a colorful array of lighting was installed, not just to make it easier to walk, but also to make the grooves and crawl spaces more attractive to visitors. The revamped cave was opened in 1964 and was instantly a success. Norman would sell the cave in 1968. Eventually, the cave system ended up in the possession of the Summit Inn's operators. Norman stayed on as a minority owner, spending much of his later years promoting and tinkering with the cave. In 1986, the grandson of Norman Kale bought back the shares in the cave. At present, the property remains in the Kale family. But you've probably noticed that it's not called Delaney Cave anymore or Kale Cave. The Laurel Cavern's name was an idea of Dave Kale, Norman's grandson, who discovered that John Paxton had in fact named the cave Laurel Hill Cave during his 1816 visit. While Norman worried a name change would confuse visitors, today's Laurel Caverns is visited by tens of thousands of people annually. Let's take a look at this map, which you can purchase from the gift shop and gives a very good overview of the intricate network of passageways that make up Laurel Caverns. Now, the cave is divided into three segments. You have the upper cave, the flue, and the lower cave. The upper cave is what most of the general public sees. This is the lighted portion of the cave. The flue and lower cave are open for guided splunking tours. Uh, the flu is pretty, from what I've gathered, is for people that are getting into caving, and the lower cave is for people that are experienced cavers. And keep in mind, this is about four miles worth of passageways entirely. But for most of the video, we'll be focusing on this upper cave portion. Now, when you purchase your tickets, you'll be given two different options. One is a 30 minute guided tour, which primarily walks about 600 feet in what we know that as the maze. And you can well see from the image below what that looks like. Or you can do a self-guided tour, which they say takes about 45 minutes. And that'll take you down into the very edges of the upper cave. You'll go down, then you'll go up. There's a lot of walking. <laughs> or you can choose to do both the guided tour and then do the self-guide experience, which is what I personally recommend to get the most bang for your buck. When one first enters Laurel Caverns, you may ask, where are the stalagmites and stalactites? Well, there aren't any, and there's a reason for this. Remember, the cave was formed out of water droplets containing carbonic acid, making contact with Royal Hannah limestone. This particular limestone is only one-third calcium and two-thirds sand. This low concentration of calcium, along with layers of rock and sandstone overhead, deprives the carbonic acid water the necessary ingredients to create the formations that are iconic with the word cave. Laurel Caverns instead employs colorful lighting to exemplify the fantastical manner in which Mother Nature used her carving knife to form the miles of passages. When one first slips underneath the visitor center, they will immediately enter part of the maze. It's a complex array of nooks and crannies that I can best describe as nature's version of a room and pillar mining operation. Carefully placed rocks and wooden rail guides visitors through this section. Otherwise, one would become lost like the boys out of Smithfield did 200 years ago. The maze features Laurel Cavern's most famed formation, the Pillar of Hercules, a long flat stone that perfectly bounces upon a pillar of rock that has been carved extremely thin by nature. Note the inch of clearance that separates the rock from the ceiling. Now my favorite portion of the cave is in fact on the self-guided experience. You start by snaking through a man-made tunnel that doubles as an entrance for bats. The cave is closed in the winter months to allow for bats to hibernate. But this begins one's descent of 17 stories down into the heart of Laurel Caverns. It's called the Hall of the Mountain King, with the chandelier lighting added to the name. You pass through rooms with broken shell, then step down through a long but at times narrow passage. The whole passageway makes me think that I'm off to find One-Eyed Willie's treasure. The Hall of the Mountain King opens up into the dining room. It's a sprawling chamber with ledges and broken rock perching over the expanse like a table. It's also here you'll see a noticeable change in the cave floor's steepness. This change is defined in a fault line, 
one of several that we'll come across if one descends deeper into the unlit portions of the cave. For the average visitor, however, it's time to begin snaking up through Solomon's Squeeze. And now comes the joy of walking up 17 stories at a steep angle. And yes, that is sarcasm in my voice. But as much as my legs hurt, this passageway is an awesome sight. This is the Grand Canyon of the Laurel Caverns. The canyon itself is peering down at you. It's a long joint in which the carbonic acid water seeped through to form the passages. Be sure to take pauses to both rest your legs and admire the grandeur of the canyon as it shoots down into the darkness below. As you snake through the passages, you'll return to the maze. Do I hear water? Laurel Caverns does indeed have a small stream flowing through parts of it. Although much of the stream is far below the sand floors, one can see it makes a 45 foot trickle from different levels of the cave. A site that has been dubbed Calico Falls. But be careful, this is the only spot in the entire cave where I've accidentally knocked my head. At least I didn't hit it on this crab claw looking rock. Maybe it's just me, but it appears this rock has the appearance of the face of an old man. I'll dub it Old Man Rock. Okay, maybe someone in the comments can create a more creative title. After all, the naming aspect is partly what makes showcase like Laurel Caverns such unique experiences. I've always found the careful placement of lighting in show caves to be a unique way to draw the average person into appreciating the wonders of Mother Nature. The stories about how these passages were discovered and charted only enriches each formation. When done right, show caves are a melding of both natural and human history. Laurel Cavern's slogan is, where learning goes underground, and it certainly achieves that objective. All right, so we got to see a lot of cool rock uh, formations down there in the cave. And I definitely got my steps in, whole 17 stories. You know, it's, it's bad enough trying to drive your car up Chestnut Ridge. It's another thing trying to walk up to Chestnut Ridge while you're inside Chestnut Ridge. So that's an interesting experience. But if you want to see Laurel Caverns yourself, it is a few miles east of Uniontown, Pennsylvania. I uh, highly recommend. They're typically open May through October, seven days a week. Be sure to check their website, though. I'm probably, my brain could be a little bit foggy on that. So hopefully you'll get to explore Laurel Caverns on your own at some point. If not, I hope this video serves as a good substitute in the meantime. If you like what you see, videos like this and other retracing history videos, be sure to subscribe to Readout Productions. And I have started a Kofi page where you can buy me a cup of cappuccino. Hey, thank you guys for watching. We'll see you in the next video.